Hey everybody, there are a ton of ways that you can follow us online. We've got our website, realnerdspodcast.com, that you can go to and you can read articles and find the podcast episodes there as well. If you like social media, you can follow us on Facebook at Real Nerds Podcast or on Twitter and Instagram at Real Nerds. You can also call us anytime and leave a voicemail at 720-6-NERDS-5 and then we'll play your voicemail on the show. Thanks for listening. I hope you like us. Hey, what's up everybody? This is Ming Chen from AMC's Comic Book Men. Listen, I have my own podcast. I have my own podcast studio. I don't really care about those. What I really care about is the Real Nerds Podcast, the best podcast in the universe, in the multiverse, in, in, on all Earth, 616 and beyond. Listen to it. Subscribe right now and uh, listen to this episode. Listen to all the episodes, but especially listen to, the, listen to the one that I'm on. It might be the best. Thank you, guys. Welcome to Realness Podcast, where for 10 years we've gone to see a new movie and podcast as our experience to the world. This week we saw West Side Story. This week with me is just Zach. Just Zach, the most disappointing lone nerd imaginable. What? How is it that what we are doing this week has only you and I, Brad? This makes no sense. Uh, well, I... Uh went and poisoned uh ryan's son's uh, lunch oh at school so, so, so he's at home cleaning cleaning up vomit and can't talk with us gotcha so that is an admission on the air is what you're telling me yeah i mean i i'm pretty close to eclipsing his uh all-time appearance records so i i, I feel no shame uh in admitting that because i'm a sociopath now <laughs> Wait now? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Excuse me. I I, I didn't realize that uh, that that this was just a new phenomenon in your life. But um, okay. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it came out that way because I made it up on the spot. That didn't happen. Um, yeah, Ryan's just, is Kellen sick, so he's at home, and we're, we're stuck here. Yeah, gotcha. We're but doing a James, movie. James has no excuse though, because this is his boy that we're talking about today. Uh, you know what? Uh, uh, James's family is more important than Spielberg. So, well, uh, wait, wait, hold on, hold on, hold on. Does that mean that I'm the ultimate Spielberg fan now? Uh, how dare you? Uh, uh, I'm here. Uh, no, excuse me, sir. No, 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 no. He Do you like 1941? <laughs> it's I, I've seen it once, and uh, I've I seen it more I than once. It. <laughs> well, congratulations. <laughs> Thank Have you. Have you seen Duel? Yes, I have. Have you seen Night Gallery? Ooh, touche. I haven't watched all of Night Gallery, and I certainly haven't yeah, seen the episodes. <laughs> eat a dick! <laughs> oh, God. How many this times have you watched brutal. Munich? Do you even oh, own Munich? God. No, I don't, and I've only seen it once. See, I, I knew it. Hmm. Ryan and I even did a commentary for Munich. And it was just us sitting that, that there watching actually, it for two hours. That actually, that, that is actually really fucking cool. <laughs> How far back was this? Uh, pre real nerds, uh, but it's bad because we're just like we start out, and then the movie's so amazing that we just get sucked into it and don't say anything for like a long time. That's no, that's a good commentary because you're just acknowledging the movie's greatness by saying nothing. Yeah, it's a trick. <laughs> um no yeah that's um but yeah so i guess this we should lead into what we're talking about yeah so like i said we uh this week our, our movie is west side story stay tuned to the end of the episode where we will review it generally and then after the trailer we will go into spoiler territory although it's a remake of a pro- play and an existing movie so and it's sure. also a retelling of romeo and juliet but in new york city so yeah it's like three times remade and also I never watched the play or the original movie, so mm, I okay. didn't know. You know, I, I I guess it could have been spoiled for me, but um, I don't feel like if I had been told anything, like 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 you said, it's it's no secret it's a Romeo and Juliet 
uh, adaptation. So, mm-hmm. you know, a see a secret one, huh? <laughs> is it? What? I think it's. I think it's pretty aware that it's Romeo and Juliet. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't hear people talk about it much. So when I was watching, I was like, man, this is just, yeah. But anyway, uh, until then, we're going to maybe talk about news uh what blu-ray and 4k releases are coming out and then what we've been watching so yeah zach why don't you uh did you find some news for us it's real news you know i did um actually um it's movie related and such is that uh anne rice has died at the age of 80 uh, she was the author of the beloved Vampire Chronicles book series, which were then adapted into books, uh, into films, um, most famously Interview with a Vampire starring Tom Cruise, Brad Pitt, and Kirsten Dunst, um, but also Queen of the Damned, which was um, Aaliyah's final film before her death. Um, but she had, a, she, had quite a, she had quite a fan base. Um, and I, 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 I must confess, I've never been drawn to read her, but she influ- she she created the basis for two films that like have gone on to entertain a lot of people so it's sad to see her go but she lived a hell of a life like r- practically uh set the tone for a lot of vampire lore going forward since the 90s so yeah i'd say uh she has a, probably a little bit of a responsibility for ushering in the ya movement with uh goth you know vampires and things so yeah, and I, in and in some sense, you could say that she's kind of responsible for what for for laying the groundwork that would allow Twilight to exist. And you know, I, I mean, I'm aware that people like those books, and you know, I, I love that they love them. But uh, you know, regardless of like where your opinion lies on all that stuff, it's it's pretty cool that she was able to kind of create something like that out of whole cloth, starting in the '70s. You know, mm-hmm. like that's that's no easy feat to like create something that's create a vampire lore that's just as impactful as dracula itself like that's not a that's not a that's not a hard that's not an easy thing to do my friend no <laughs> but yeah yeah no sorry i was just looking i was looking for you to acknowledge that that is correct <laughs> <laughs> sure yeah i failed <laughs> typical me anyway that's news Wow, cool. All right. Well, uh, what's coming out on Blu-ray and 4K? DVD releases and Blu-rays. Well, um, Venom Let There Be Carnage uh, is coming to you in 4K. Oh, you Blu-ray. fail again. How, how did <laughs> you know what? I enjoyed I Venom Let There Be Carnage. It better be good. I you know what? Andy Circus's Venom Let There Be Carnage was fun. I enjoyed it just fine. You know what's tough for me is that the steelbook looks really cool. And I already own the other one. So as a completist, I feel like I have to get it, but I know I'm never going to watch it. How about this? How about this? Can I give you something else to get? Sure. Can, can I give you something else? The Red Shoes in 4K from Criterion Collection. Powell and Pressburger's tw- dancing nightmare movie filled with Technicolor Wonder available now in Criterion 4K. I'll probably just wait for the 50% off sale then. Uh smart choice yeah just hold on to the money you were going to spend on them let there be carnage and get a classic film from 1948 that has inspired such films as black swan for example so yeah cool uh among new releases also is the last duel in 4k the film that nobody saw in theaters which is a shame because it apparently uh, uh, looks really good so, i saw it <laughs> oh i'm sorry you and corinne did see it that's right and i messed up by not seeing it which means i am on ridley scott's hit list um but yeah no you guys can check that out on 4k now i will pick it up you're such a filthy gen Zer. yeah i'm a stupid millennial fuck me running right hey you know what i have a defense for myself it's you can't you can't say that stuff when you yourself created two lucrative sci- sci-fi franchises i don't want to hear it <laughs> Who wants to go see like three consecutive rape scenes done differently each time? Like, ugh. well, I think you're going for acting and for a discussion point on the current movement as told through allegory. So, um, which in itself is a very noble effort and something that doesn't fully exist anymore in the current theatrical market. That doesn't mean Ridley Scott has to be an asshole. <laughs> um, anyway, should I move on? Can I, can I move on to something a little bit more fun? Please. 
Mitchell and the Machines uh, is coming to you on Blu-ray. Uh, the Netflix animated film from the creators of Spider-Man into the Spider-Verse. Um, have you have you seen this yet? Uh, yet again, I do not have Netflix anymore. Although I will once Cobra Kai comes back. Gotcha. So you're so when you when you go to pick up uh, Cobra Kai again, you can check out Mitchell and the Machines. Um, and uh, Arrow's got some stuff coming out. They're putting out the Snake Girl and the Silver Haired Witch from 1968, and they're also reissuing Dune in 4K. Um, oh fuck, that reminds me, I still haven't seen Dune in theaters yet. Ah, uh, damn it. I guess I'm going to HBO Max for that one. Uh, MVD oh, is putting out. I I know I. It's finding two and a half hours. <laughs> it's finding two and a half hours. Um, MVD is putting out Jack Frost and Jack Frost Two. Uh, the horror double bill of schlocky home video goodness can be yours via MVD's Rewind Collection. Um, or if you're lucky enough, you can probably pick up Jack Frost from Vinegar Syndrome, which did a wonderful restoration or wonderful job on that uh, Blu-ray. Uh, you can get My Stepmother is an Alien from 1988 coming to you from Arrow Video. Uh, coming to you also on the 4K front is The Wolf of Wall Street, a.k.a. Martin Scorsese's The Wolf of Wall Street, a.k.a. Not a Marvel Movie. So if you want to check that out, you are more than welcome to. Uh, I like that movie. People watch it wrong. Ivanhoe from 1952, the Warner Archive Classics uh, collection is putting this one out for you. So if you want to check this out, please do. Uh, and The Card Counter from 2021, uh, the new, latest Paul Schrader movie featuring Oscar Isaac, uh, can now be yours on Blu-ray. You can also get season one of the Abbott and Costello show from Classic Flicks. Um, and this looks very interesting. Uh, this I have never seen them packaged in such a way where they're going by season. So that's really neat. Abbott and Costello show is a lot of fun. I prefer the radio show, but that's okay. It's all fun. Uh, and uh, we are also getting Going Berserk from 1983, coming to you from Shout Selects. Uh, you can also pick up The Four Seasons with Alan Alda and Carol Burnett uh, in a Kino Lorber packaging. And looks like that's about it, buddy. Cool. That sounds like enough. Yeah, I think I think that's a I think there's a sturdy selection of things. You know, you can pick up some Venom stuff, or you can pick up Wolf of Wall Street. Uh, yeah, or the Red Shoes. If if you have a lot of money, you can try for all those. But if you're like the rest of us, you know, probably won't. One of those things in there is for you. Uh, why don't you tell us what you've been watching this week? Really quickly, I will say actively out loud that that Wolf of Wall Street steelbook looks fucking cool. <laughs> I like that artwork. Anyway, the one we've been watching? Yep. All righty. So, uh, yeah, this is the stuff we've been watching. Okay, right on. So, um, what have I been watching? Not a lot. Um, not a lot. Uh, been a lot of cre- uh, been a lot of cool stuff happening in my life that has taken precedent over films. However, uh, I did uh, rewatch The Bishop's Wife at Film Club, uh, and uh, the movie still rocks. Cary Grant. It's a secret X Men movie, guys. Um, he's an angel who's sent down to help uh, a bishop get over his obsession with his job and less about and not spending time with his wife, but. He has angel powers that look suspiciously like X-Men powers. He can control ornaments, which means he could feasibly control glass, which means he's an X-Men. And he can also skate unlike any other human being on the planet. And you could say that's an angel power, but I say X-Men. So uh, anyway, yeah, Bishop's Wife. It's it's a holiday classic. Check it out if you'd like. Uh, And then for Ballyhoo recently, um, I uh, did Whatever whatever Happened to Baby Jane from 1962. and uh, I fucking love that movie. I have not watched it since high school, but God damn it, that thing still had me uh, had me by the throat. Um, for anybody who doesn't know it, it's about Betty. It's with Betty Davis and Joan Crawford. They play sisters. Um, Betty Davis plays Baby Jane, who was a vaudeville child star who uh, was like very known and had her own line of dolls. And then as she got older. Her sister Blanche, played by Joan Crawford, became more successful in movies. Uh, it leads to jealousy and it leads to her. What we are told is that baby Jane runs over her sister 
and uh, cripples her by severing her spine. And the movie becomes about Blanche trying to sell their house uh, and baby Jane catching on to it and basically torturing her sister throughout the process of also trying to revive her career. Uh, it's a very campy, but frankly, watching it around this time, I would say it's campy, but it's a very sincere horror movie all at once. So yes, things are very grandiol and very like super eccentric uh, and balls to the wall. This could easily be seen uh, as a form of camp humor, but I think that it works in both camps um, and Betty Davis is fantastic in it. It's, it's a movie that I'd love to know what you think of Brad, like, cause it's not, it's, it's unapologetically brutal. <laughs> um uh especially for 1962 um and um and then i also uh started uh picking back up fruit baskets so i watched the second episode today um if you'll recall from the last discussion that i had it, i wish corinne was here to talk about it so hopefully she comes back next week so we can talk more about it but uh the episode that we left out on was uh uh, uh was our lead character is discovering that the house that she's living in now is filled with people who can turn into the Chinese Zodiac. Uh, and so this second episode picks up uh, with her dealing with the revelation uh, that she's been, <laughs> that's been foist upon her. And she has basically to uh, the, the, the Yuki, the, the, the lead guy that she has a crush on um, and is fascinated with can turn into a, a, a rat or a mouse and he uh he carries with him this this uh embarrassment of turning into uh, a mouse and the our our lead character sorry <laughs> i'm still trying to process all the characters names and get them memorized but uh to her, to, toru uh toru's uh basically like i don't care what you look like i just hope that we could still be friends even after you erase my memory so that i know nothing of your secret and so the entire household decides to keep it a secret uh, decides to let her keep the secret so long as she just promises not to tell anybody and she can still live in their house so it's kind of a nice episode of you know like learning more about the characters that are just outside of toru's um uh purview and learning about what makes them tick um we also have the revelation of uh Yiro being a cat and uh so and again i'm sorry if i'm getting the names wrong but he's kind of temperamental he's an outsider in the zodiac and he's but you get this character sense that he's got a little bit more depth to him and that we're going to find it out in later episodes um, and it reaches a boiling point when he's forced to go to school along with Yuki and Toru. And um, uh, I, I'm curious to see where this goes. This is a show that is getting me more emotionally involved than plot driven involved. And so I kind of want to know where everything goes with these characters and what their arcs are rather than worrying about a ov grand overarching plot. From what I can gather, there's no big overarching plot that I'm supposed to be like on the lookout for. Uh, so instead, I'm kind of getting a character piece, which is really nice. So um, if anybody hasn't seen Fruits Basket, it's available on Hulu. Uh, and uh, I, I'd check it out. Um, if you can get through the ads and everything, um, I think you're in for a fun time with Anime Land. So and that's all I've been watching this week. Sorry, it's kind of a brief uh, description, but I kind of wish that Corinne were here for, with me to talk about it because I have like a ton of questions for her on this. So. Yeah, there's something uh, I wanted to ride around for a couple weeks ago. He was missed, uh, so I get it. Yeah, we're in a weird limbo here. Uh, Brad, what did you watch? Uh, this is always frustrating because it always seems like I watch the most stuff during a film explosion week. So, uh, yeah, I, I did I talk about House of Gucci last time I did no, this segment? Didn't. No, you didn't, but I've seen it, so let's talk about it. Yeah, uh, I'd rather watch a documentary about the House of Gucci. <laughs> um because oh, it, it's a it's mean <laughs> it's a competent movie but it's just it's hard to like enjoy a story where a bunch of wealthy people screw up their lives <laughs> you know that um, that's a very good point that's a very good point because like there was this disconnect for me going like i could care less about these rich people fucking each other over and yet 
I did appreciate this kind of like weird campy gangster movie out of Ridley Scott. So it's like, I'm kind of torn between the two. Yeah. As soon as Adam driver, like, like you see him turn, like you're like, Oh, there's no one to root for in this movie. <laughs> oh no, they're all terrible. They're all yeah. terrible. They're all so, spoiled brats in some way or another. But uh, the fascinating thing I found was that, um, so I, I did some research afterwards uh, and uh it's been a couple weeks. So I forget her name. But the character Lady Gaga plays, you know, Mrs. Gucci. Uh, she <laughs> she has since been released from prison, so she's just out and about now. And the whole movie, they don't mention that they had two daughters. Patrizia, Patrizia, sorry. Um, yeah, and yeah, the whole movie they don't mention they actually had two daughters the whole time. Mm-hmm. And I'm guessing that's probably because the other daughter didn't give her rights to the movie. More than likely, yeah. Um. So, but still, it was, it was just odd. Be like, oh wow. Um. Uh, what's his name? Mor Morizano. Um. The wait, which one? What, Ad, Adam Driver's character. Oh, Maurizio. 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 Yeah. Maurizio. Maurizio. Yeah. Uh. Don't yeah, don't so. don't you dare go down Ryan's path. <laughs> I don't want to hear it out of you. Anyway, yeah. So that was just like an interesting couple things that they didn't touch on in the uh in the movie uh mm. so yeah it was it was fine you know it was, it was pretty common it was actually not i don't know like you, you see, most it was surprised like most movies from the 80s it didn't seem as stylish as what i expected you know mm-hmm. i i there are things that i like about the film i i really like al pacino in it as aldo gucci yeah, again, another great character. It's really is that one scene where you, it kind of pulls the power card, and you're like, "Oh, they're yeah, all terrible." He, you know what I do love that he only has one outburst moment. I love that they're the people who are using him are using him for the outburst only once, and they're giving him room to breathe the rest of the time. Yeah, because the part where he that... breaks down and cries is pretty like his best part in, the, in that movie. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, he hands over his company. Yep, and I like uh. uh the like i don't know if he's like a consigliere for them necessarily but like he's a like he he's like a consultant for the family on their business affairs but it's a uh played by jack houston and i really like watching him just be like an absolute like pain in lady gaga's side in that movie <laughs> he's kind of like i'm sorry this is just the way it is like <laughs> yeah it's cool to see him play that family and totally exploit them Oh yeah, absolutely. He's the secret. You see, if there's a good guy, technically it's him. <laughs> I don't know if he's a good guy. I'm not sure. <laughs> he's like he's, doing he's, good with that company. Chaotic neutral. How about that? Yeah. <laughs> um, and I, I do find that um uh I, I'm usually not one for Jared Leto, but I do think he's fine in this movie. I think he's just fine in this movie. Yeah, um, I I know uh yeah, his performance isn't accurate to perhaps that person um but it's it's definitely a like, it makes the movie more interesting for sure because like you know like you look like visually like it, movies like alien, alien and blade runner and then there's this movie that seems to kind of like visually a pretty standard biopic looking movie yeah and um but yeah i mean it's i think it's a fine movie but i agree i i frankly would rather watch a documentary that could also catch up with where they've been since because yeah. that that would be interesting to me too yeah um the other thing i watched was a movie called shiva baby which is uh about a a jewish girl who has turned to prostitution to help uh get herself through college or whatever her plans are for the future um Mm -hmm. and actually there's a running theme between everything i watched this week that it's hard to like the movies because none of the characters are (laughs) you can get behind so this girl um you know, the last guy she sees on her way to a, a funeral, um, she ends up running into him at the funeral because he's actually connected to her family. And so the whole movie is just her at this funeral, avoiding her family and talking about her college plans and then trying to get around this guy who's also apparently married. Um, and so his wife's at the funeral and uh, her ex-girlfriend's at the funeral. And uh, she just keeps walking in and out of these situations and just making it worse for herself Mm. um so it's a small movie uh but it was uh it's got a lot of side characters and 
you know, it's, it's all performed pretty well, but at the end of the day, you're just like, she's kind of an asshole. <laughs> like mm. it's probably good that she, uh, invited all this, uh, bad stuff on herself. And, you know, it's, it's full of like awkward moments and it was cool to like get an insight into, uh, you know, Jewish culture that I don't usually get to. So yeah. Oh, right on. Sounds uh, pretty neat. Then I also watched a movie called Silent Night, which has an incredibly misleading trailer, uh, but it has Kira Knightley in it and a bunch of other British people and uh, Jojo from Jojo Rabbits in there because I think his mom directed it. And it's got apparently his twin brothers in it. So uh, there's this family that is celebrating Christmas and they all go out to this mansion. Um, again, wealthy people. They go out to a mansion to celebrate Christmas and uh, there's the threat of like there's this um, cloud that's roaming the English countryside that it's going to kill everyone. Hmm. Uh, so, you know, you think the movie starts out as this like, oh, they're going to go have a nice holiday together and everyone's kind of dreading it a little bit for some reason. And then you find out there's this ecological disaster that's uh, being thrust upon them. And then you find out that everyone's out there because they know they're going to die. And the government hmm. has given them all suicide pills and so they're going to enjoy Christmas together and then take the suicide pill um, except uh, the kid from Jojo is skeptical that this is even true hmm. um, and it's the trailer makes it seem like a fun like almost um, oh, was it like a, I forget the name of it right now ready or not like mm-hmm. like a horror comedy when it's really like a, just a horror drama <laughs> really? uh, with all these this this large family and their friends like struggling with accepting that they're going to die or believing they are because you know and then there's this their the their their son who's like skeptical about it and he starts asking all these questions and there's the, there's even a doctor at the party and then suddenly like by the end of the movie you're, you're just like was this an anti-vax movie <laughs> which is because uh you know at one point towards the end it kind of seems like yeah that the, like the killer cloud is fake um because a bunch of people touch it and they don't die and then there's like a scene where the kid does get sick because he encountered it but then he like opens his eyes at the end of the movie and you're just like oh come on man uh yeah but yeah his supposed death like confirms for everyone else that they should take the pill you know hmm. um yeah it's just it, it's a it's a lot of like dialogue scenes and it's um uh what was it has have you seen it's a disaster no i've heard of it though yeah i think henry watched it too uh but it just like the whole time i was like this is that movie just done on like a larger scale because it's a disaster is like i think maybe like three couples at a Sunday brunch Mm -hmm. uh, contained in a house um, like pretty small. And then there's just like the illusion of like uh, a dirty bomb went off downtown and the, the the radiation's coming. And so like, you know, occasionally people outside on the sidewalk will be shown like passed out, (laughs) you know, cause they died from the, but everyone inside, like it's slowly seeping in through the windows. And it's just like, it's kind of the same premise here. Hmm. Um, but like, you know, the, the cloud and everything is like more big budget. Like you can actually see like toxic funnels running through, uh, you know, blacked out London, uh, downtown and, um, yeah. And it's in this mansion instead of just like a house in the suburbs, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. But yeah. And all the characters are just like, not great. Like there's this one girl who brings her girlfriend to the party and everyone ignores her. Um, and even her own girlfriend's like mean to her and uh yeah the the Kira Knightley's family like her kids are really shitty like the twins uh you know like when they're about to die they, they're like they're gonna take the pill with a glass of coke and like they keep making the dad go back downstairs because you know, at one point it's not cold enough uh they can't share they have to have their each have their own and it's just like they're really spoiled um yeah Hmm. and there's one girl who there's who's pregnant and they're all making her feel bad uh that she's like um like socially conscious um 
Yeah. Huh. Sounds interesting. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And then like there's a interconnected thing where uh, some of the friends have slept with each other and they didn't tell each other, you know, mm. that thing. Gotcha. So it's like that's pretty conventional. But yeah, huh. it's, at the end, it's, it's like, man, does, was this like a don't trust the government thing? Like, uh, that's too bad. <laughs> um, I, I feel like it's weird that some of these actors sign on for that. But um. Well, it could be it. It could be within the guise of a black comedy, pointing out the ridiculousness of it. Yeah, it's hard to tell. Uh, but anyway, that was that. Probably talk too much on that one. Mm. Um, I bought the uh, yeah, I bought the uh, the Karate Kid 4K box set, and Ooh. I just want to note that uh, the box says on the back that Karate Kid Three doesn't have any special features. <laughs> um, it's just the movie, but it does have the trailer on it. So, okay so he lied a uh, little little fib there um so you do get at least one bonus thing uh, but yeah it's pretty bare bones it would have been nice to have a uh there, i think there's a commentary track actually but i can't remember because i watched three and two hmm. um but yeah it's 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 a nice set for someone who's like most of the 2000s they didn't really include three with anything hmm. okay um, and then uh, last thing I watched was being the Ricardos, which uh, was good. Um, yeah, you know, it's it's got a lot of snappy dialogue. Obviously, thanks um, for inviting me. By the way, uh, I <laughs> figured you would have figured out by now that a lot of times I just go to the movies when I look up from what I'm working at. And I'm like, oh, I have five minutes to get to a screening, and okay. I'm just gonna like wait around for everyone to like, you know. Some people have tons of podcasts they're recording and never have time <laughs> and started relationships with new people that I'm not going to, you know, do a text being back and forth to see if I, you know, I'm just going to go. <laughs> Point taken. Continue. Yeah. So actually, like, I, I just went because I was down by the CRT. So I was like, do I want to go see West Side Story again? Or do I want to go to the CRT? So I was like, I want to go to the CRT. So I'm just going to see being the Ricardos. And, and uh, uh, but yeah, how is it? Yeah, like it's fine. It's got snappy dialogue. Um, and it's the movie is like one week in an episode of the I Love Lucy show. Mm-hmm. There's just a bunch of shit happening uh, between her dealing with an accusation of being a communist and the quality of the mm-hmm. show. Um, gotcha. So all the people, Lucy and Ricky and the staff are always kind of dealing with all these different problems uh, all at the same time. Does the, um, I'm going to take a stab in the dark because I've actually been willfully ignorant of this plot up until this point. Do they do the speech at the end where, because uh, the accusations of being a communist. I, I think I'm ahead of you, yes. What? Yeah, because it leads to Desi coming out and saying the only thing that's read about Lucy is her hair. Uh, he didn't actually mention that in the speech. I don't think that didn't come mm-hmm. up. Then that means Aaron Sorkin rewrote history. <laughs> yeah, I'm not surprised. I I found her to believe that this is how this played out. Well, <laughs> I'm sure, well clearly, yeah, but no, yeah. but no, yeah, the, it's one of those things where like all the characters are super intelligent, competent, you know. Mm-hmm. I mean, I I kind of figured that there was going to be there's going to be discussion about where their marriage is going at that certain point. But also, if it's about the communist thing in particular, that's interesting because I I I actually didn't peg that to be the plot of the movie. I figured it might actually be about their relationships full decline. Well, it's it's all those things. Like I said, they're dealing with the many different things, and like some of them is that yeah, Lucy's dealing well. The whole show is dealing with like, you know, if the public doesn't accept that this is just an attack on her, then the show will probably be canceled within a week. Right. And then meanwhile, Lucy's suspicious of Ricky the whole time mm-hmm. uh, in his, you know, going out and playing cards on the boat. Um, and then yeah. she's also trying to make the episode that she's currently working on better. So she's fighting with Jess Oppenheimer and... Uh, uh-huh. Yeah, her co-stars, uh, Fred Nethel, you know, um, yeah, the, 
woman who played Ethel Vivian Vance, you know, she's struggling with being the less, less attractive co-star. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, uh, uh, I forget who the actor's name for Fred is. But oh, Bill, Bill Frawley. Yeah. Bill Frawley, J.K. Simmons is playing him. And it's cool because he starts out being like kind of a, a pain in the ass at the table read. But at the end of the movie, he's like this important support structure for both of them. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah. Yeah, that's a, that's, a, that's a theory that I didn't realize in, until I kind of read into it a couple, like a month ago, of like Bill Frawley being like a good support beam for everything. Yeah because he is it's basically like facilitating a lot of the shenanigans that he and uh she and ethel get into but yeah i i'm i'm i I can almost guarantee that you'll enjoy this movie so oh i'm sure i will i I, you know i was talking about this with my parents my my i loved i love lucy when i was a kid like because that was a that was a nick at night show that was still on nick at night when i first discovered it and i did a report on lucy in fourth grade um, I read up on her. The older I get, the more disparaged I get when I read about some of the things that she did out of nastiness because she was reportedly, I guess it depends on how you view it because she was a very powerful, determined woman in her industry. And she's extremely like accolades all around for her on that. But there are times when I have read that Lucy is was not the nicest of human beings and suffered from her own issues in a way that she didn't necessarily like uh, behave accordingly, despite that behavior. I, I it, it's hard to explain. Like there are people who are fans of Lucy and then there are people who dislike Lucy intently. And I'm kind of in the middle because it's hard to ignore how powerful her impact was on me. And also how powerful her impact was on the entire industry. Yeah. Um the, the, and she hell she's the reason we have star trek you know like I, yeah even if i didn't and, and like i love show. lucy yeah exactly um, like even even if i didn't like i love lucy i would love lucille ball just for the star trek thing alone you know? they also bring up that uh uh desi uh, uh apparently created the uh their type of three camera system that yeah. revolutionized how that system mm-hmm. performed for uh audiences i guess uh but anyway he was able to capture all the chaos very well and that's something he had a foresight on yeah but um, the, yeah she definitely gets a like a real uh shiny veneer like she doesn't the movie just pr- pretty much portrays her as a girl boss you know she doesn't seem to have any like uh negative aspects in the movie uh gotcha. other than just other than just being um you know pushy i guess right which which again like i you know there was there this is lucy before she was in a like a different state in her life and like yeah and again half the stories that i hear of lucy being mean i take with a grain of salt because i'm also just like yeah well like i you may have to be a little bit aggressive in in certain respects if you're going to be taken seriously as a woman in that industry at that time like it's not an easy thing to be doing and to be as powerful as she was she she was a very generous person with her time in guiding people on where they were going to go she did like acting workshops that robert osborne attended and she basically kind of told robert osborne like i don't know if you'll be a good actor but you would definitely you're definitely good at talking about movies and that's like shoot what did what did Ros- what robert osborne end up doing just serving for years under tcm's banner before his death like, yeah, another thing they're dealing with in the episode is uh they're trying to announce that she's pregnant so they're ah. fighting with the network over mm-hmm. showing that on yeah. tv and then yeah they couldn't they, they you can't say the word pregnant on television was a big thing the name of the episode is lucy is incente yeah and so desi is uh you know working over the uh the network trying mm-hmm. to you know, his, his argument is like we have the number one show what are you gonna do about it <laughs> that's a fair point to give yeah. to bill paley <laughs> Does Philip Morris <laughs> want to not advertise on the number one show anymore? Oh, God. So. I, I know for a fact that's why Jack could never be on that show because he was sponsored by Lucky Strike Cigarettes. So they wouldn't, the, the competing clause wouldn't allow them to guest on each other's shows. Yeah, they mentioned Jack Benny in this movie. So I know you're going to like it. <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah. Are you telling me that Aaron Sorkin 
wrote down the name Jack Benny into his script. He did. He had uh, <gasps> Lucille Ball deliver it. Fuck yeah. Good for you, Aaron Sorkin. You made my favorite movie of the year. All right. Because, <laughs> yeah, the movie also jumps around in time, too. So, as like, Ooh. you know, while they're doing this week, they flash back. And so, you know, they, they go to early periods where she and Desi met. And then when she did radio for a brief moment. And then when she did some film. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah, because she was um she was on a show called My Favorite Husband um on radio that was competing up against Armis Brooks. And basically my favorite husband isn't really carried on into television with her. And that's it. My favorite husband is very much a impetus point for I Love Lucy, but it's not like the spark for I Love Lucy. It's like it's the starting point because Lucy was a was an RKO contract player for so many years basically getting nothing to do like she she had to earn her stripes as a comedian in a lot of respects in various different forms but um but yeah it, i i can't wait to see this movie i'll shut up about it now i i'll I was gonna I'll say you're, you're, you're yeah. describing another entire scene in the movie right now so no, God. <laughs> uh, yeah There's... yeah she's at the table with the network and she's like uh i don't want to do the my favorite husband um mm -hmm. yeah because it wasn't supposed to be desi she's like i'll do it if it's desi but if it's not mm -hmm. then i'm walking yeah which um <laughs> i'll ask one more thing and then i'll stop do they mention that desi was the band leader on the bob hope program during radio at one point uh they might have but it, it might have been like a throwaway <laughs> line because they do talk about him being a band leader and that mm -hmm. being his like um you know he he wanted to be an actor and then it didn't work out so he just fell into the band thing um, yeah, because that's where Babalu comes from, and his version of Cuban Pete is very, very good. Very, very good. Um, yeah. I know we knew it from the mask today, but his version swings, man. Uh, yeah. So yeah, that's all I watched this week. I watched Hawkeye, but I I think it was like a episode that pushed the series along. Is more of like again, I wish Ryan was here, or at least Corinne, because uh, yeah, it, it felt like it was more of just like you should stop following Hawkeye around because you're a kid and you're going to get in trouble. You know, it's like, Oh my God, we've done Does that for like three episodes already. Did he shoot an arrow? They shoot a lot of arrows. Okay, good. Uh, yeah. So that's what I watched this week. Sweet. Uh, this week on real nerds, we watched West side story. Zach, what do you think of West side story? I loved it. God, I loved it. It was great. Um, I am not a devotee of West Side Story, the original film, um, but I was enough of a respecter of it that when the tr when I saw the trailer um, unfold that I thought something good was coming up. Although I, uh, uh, I remember a couple, I was it a couple months ago that I was being the negative Nancy for everything <laughs> and thinking like, oh, this movie's not going to be any good. That Spielberg's going down a weird, stupid path or whatever. I shouldn't have been fucking worried. Why why would I why should I have been worried? Uh this movie was pretty damn flawless. Um uh, I think that for a guy who never did a musical, Spielberg looks like he's been doing this his entire life. Like that that the 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 scope and the pacing of this movie and the elaborate momentum of those dance sequences is incredible. Um, I think he handles the material well. Uh, it, it, in a lot of ways, I, it, it just it felt more fun than when I watched the original West Side Story years ago. So, like, I, I really hope people check it out because I know it didn't do well this weekend at the box office, and I would encourage people to fucking shift shift your fucking ass over to that theater and watch something fucking spectacular for two and a half hours, please, because you you have an opportunity to watch a musical made by one of the greatest filmmakers of all time. I don't know how you are not like flying in droves to that movie. So, but yeah, go see it. It's fucking great. Brad, should people watch West Side Story? Uh, I mean, if they want to, I thought I, I, I I've actually seen the movie twice. Well, one and a half times. Um, and I didn't watched the original growing up so i went into this cold uh other than 
whatever pop culture is permeated, you know, as I was watching as, you know, the songs and everything have come through many other avenues of pop culture. So I was yeah, familiar with Maria, those. Living in, uh, I'd like to live in America. Yeah. Yeah. But then uh, um, the Romeo and Juliet angle of it, I, you know, didn't know the details of everything. So, uh, but yeah, I thought it was fine. I, uh, I think Spielberg's direction um, and touch to it definitely it definitely feels like a premium movie um Mm -hmm. uh like there's a lot of cool stuff you know with the cameras being done and staging but like overall the story again like i can't point to a character that i'm just like wow i really enjoyed this time with this with these people story-wise like just like there's just tons of tribalism and uh racism and just like territory like I, I like those kind of themes i just don't i just have no fondness for you know so i'm just like oh i just can't wait for these people to just like get over this and get out of here you know but 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 brad it's been 50 to 60 years since the original west side story come out and we haven't come out of that tribalism yet I, like I, that's why he made the movie like well i don't think it's a, even a good exploration of those themes like mm, i gotcha like it's it's like that stuff attached to romeo and juliet which already kind of has that so it's just like it like no one's really discussing the problem they're just experiencing the problem and so yeah so anyway before i let's just do the trailer and then we could talk about i guess the spoilery type stuff even though i don't really think there's spoilers to this but mm-hmm. uh, yeah yeah here's the trailer This is my first time in New York City. I want to be happy here. I want to make a life, a home. Are you ready? Tonight is about family. The first gringo boy who smiles at you. I never seen you before. I'm not Puerto Rican. Is that okay? Do you want to start World War III? You know, I wake up to everything I know either getting sold or wrecked or being taken over by people that I don't like. You keep away from him as long as you're in my house. I'm a grown-up now, Bernardo. I'm going to think for myself. Tony, we need you if we're going to war. Who are you? Friend or foe? If you go with him, no one will ever forgive you. Life matters even more than love. Yeah, I mean, I get where you're coming from. Um, I had a thought in my head when I, when Malia and I got out of it. And the big thing that I took from it was that I feel like Spielberg really, really wants to tackle a serious subject as contemporary as this. And that this was the best avenue given his mode of filmmaking and it's also a chance for him to fulfill a dream of doing a musical and so i i feel i understand where you're coming from with it what i do like in how he approached that ultimately is is that he is 
there's there's an admirable effort based off of the raw emotion that one as a teenager might feel or even just in typical like he's putting it through a lens that he himself if not experienced directly has firsthand knowledge of whether it's from his father like from his parents growing up and seeing stuff like this go on um it it there's a there's a realism in that first scene and the way they play it out between the jets and the sharks and the cops um that is just it it hits the head ham, it hits the nail right on the right, right hammer right on the nail like it's not it's not pulling any punches about what the what the theme of this movie is apart from love um but and also the very end of the movie too um which has the line of like will it be enough and will this be enough when she's waving the gun yeah is that in the original cuz i don't feel like it is i i can't remember i but, i can't remember right now but it's yeah, been it, a long it, time <laughs> it, it's that moment is about as far as it goes as far as exploring you know i did appreciate it you know at the the, the salt factory when uh tony kind of starts to address like you know where is this going to get us Mm -hmm. Um, I just want to be friends and move on Mm -hmm. Um, and you know people can't accept that so but yeah like overall like it takes Spielberg out of the equation it's still like a story that's very superficial um, about this subject so you know very uh, and then like sorry I was on a thread earlier I like when the trailer hit I just (laughs) forgot where I was going with it but as far as like characters to get pine, like even Tony and Maria, just like she's so tolerant of Tony, <laughs> like he killed her brother, <laughs> and she's just like, "Well, I still want to get laid, so why don't you keep hanging around?" You know, it's just like, oh, oh I th- I think that's a little bit crass an approach. Um, <laughs> I am, but come on, it's still like she's I over think- it really quickly. But to be fair to to the way Rachel Zugler plays it, which by the way, she's fucking great in the movie. I I thought she did a fantastic job. Um, Bernardo, her brother, has very much shackled her down to this this way of living that demands hatred of another culture. And, you know, consequently, the way Riff the way Riff converts himself, played by Mike Faced you know, like you're, you're dealing with these two extremes of prejudice. And this is something that Spielberg is really good at. He, he, he is good at these heightened versions of emotion that he's able to play with a, with a tin, with this touch of humanity that is strictly his own. And that's why I think people confuse him with sentimentalizing things rather than providing a movie version of what reality is, which doesn't get taken into account because he's he was accused of that for Schindler's List and I feel like there's a filter of a movie that goes on to any subject he touches and in this particular one it's you know 1950s 1960s 1950s musical set film and in order to do it the way he does it he has to adhere to certain elements that are already inherent in the west side story material as it stands because you you always have to keep in mind that you've got a whole fan base to appease on top of that so i think given given the template he has he pulls it off so well that i can kind of overlook like that convenience um because my head's already kind of connecting the dots on why maria would make a decision like that well i I guess she's a bit of a brat i guess because like yeah he's uh got a bit of a shackles on her life but he's not like yeah he's not locking her door he's not beating her you know um you know he didn't he didn't ruin their family uh you know it's just like other than beating a bunch of other guys in the street like he's not like i don't you know, he's not burning down buildings and killing other people yet to achieve his, his goals. He's just like, just a bit of a prick. Well, with the awful prejudice. So I'm like, Maria, 
writing him off to like that she's okay that he, you know it got him killed it feels like he's still he's still family to her so it's just like a bit shallow i guess mm. i i i'll i i don't think this will convince you either way but something that i feel like also should be factored in is, is that this because it is playing off of Romeo and Juliet it is playing off of heightened emotion and those threads do connect back to Romeo and Juliet in such a way that Juliet still wants to be with Romeo so well, I don't think Romeo and Juliet's a great play either but <laughs> <laughs> like Romeo and Juliet suck too <laughs> look 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 Brad I'm not a fan of that I'm not a fan of that play I'm not a fan of most adaptations of it so I agree I understand yeah. But um, but it, with this particular one, it has enough of the veneer that I like that I'm able to kind of I'm able I, I'm able to separate myself from it. Um, but I, I get it. I completely understand, especially if you weren't exposed to the original one and didn't like grow up with it as like a, a base point for music, movie musicals. Um, I gave it three and a half stars on Letterbox. Like I think I Spielberg does, like adds some great stuff to it. I was even sitting there like during some parts going like, wow, this looks like a movie that was made in the 60s with modern oh, technology can we talk about Vil- vilma shigmund <laughs> sorry janish kaminsky not he's not vilma sigmund yeah janish kaminsky this is I, i'm not gonna say this is the prettiest his camera has ever looked under spielberg because that would be like a bold statement but i was fucking like i was just dazzled like by every shot in this movie it just it floors you and you're right it's yeah. something about the way they're lighting it. Like it looks like it was made in the same time as the original West Side Story. Yeah, the lighting and then the, whoever did the color grade, like just it looks oh. like Technicolor, like not mm. full on, like super bright, but just like this hint of, you know, it's from that, like it's a movie filmed in that era. And I guess they did shoot it on film too, so that helps. But um, yeah, yeah I was just and, looking at it. Like, even man, if- even if not technical or at least like a color stock that was consistent from the sixties. Yeah. Like yeah, maybe it was shot on the sixties film, but yeah, it was just like, you know, this, the, the backgrounds are probably CGI and they look like, you know, they're in that space, you know, mm-hmm. I'm sure the sixties one, it looks like a soundstage most of the time I'm guessing. Uh, yeah, but I, but something that both of them do is they'll probably work with matte paintings. Um, and did the cgi is very much the map painting of of today so yeah. I, I think it's i think it's used appropriately rather than like this movie does like only has one really ambitious cg shot which is the opening yeah because of that. that wrecking ball and whatnot but yeah so they're like looking at the when they're playing with the gun on that like unfinished bridge or whatever like probably everything around that was green screen so mm-hmm. But still, it looked like they were in New York um, with all mm-hmm. this construction coming down around them. Yeah. Um, or next to the ocean. So. Right. And there are touches that, uh, like, I, I like that he switched up the location of I Feel Pretty. Like, it just felt a little bit more, it, instead of her in, like, a wedding dress or anything like that, it's just, it's it's more just you know, it, it, it's a little bit more realistic to the experience of somebody who's having to work an overnight shift. Like, you know, where was it before? I haven't seen the, if I'm recalling correctly, I think they're like, like they, they're, she's putting on a wedding dress. I'm trying to remember. Fuck. They're just out I'm shopping. Damn. This is my, this is, my, this is why I need to rewatch this. I, I'm God damn. It. it just, this feels like, Oh yeah. It's at, um, uh, it's Maria's it's her bedroom. And uh, uh, and uh, in the stage show, but in the bridal shop in the in the original film. So yeah, it's like she's putting on, she's she's. God, I'm trying to remember. God damn it! I'm gonna rewatch the original West Side Story and get back to you, bud. Okay. Well, yeah. Whatever. It's fine. Yeah. No. It's a. It's probably moved to the department store because yeah, we've been in your bedroom plenty in that movie. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah. Oh, and um, America being out in the streets and not on their um, on uh, the rooftop, I think is better. You get that that whole s- dancing in the streets thing; just it looks gorgeous. Yeah, yeah. It's just I, 
go see this movie, guys. Stop fucking just waiting for Spider Man. This you can you can watch this while waiting for Spider Man, please. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> It really bothers me that this movie didn't make a lot of money. I'm like, really, guys? It's established IP. It's a musical. It's made for the big screen by one of the world's greatest filmmakers. And you guys aren't going? What is the deal here? I think I I read something. You know, unlike something like In the Heights, you know, it doesn't have modern songs. And it's an established thing. So it's hard to attract people. Like the people who are fans of the original probably only watch movies at home anyway at that age they're at so that's so, fair that's fair it might have been smarter to get Spielberg to adapt a newer musical but mm. obviously he wants to do this one for his dad so yeah that was that was something interesting because like isn't the if this is his populist film that means his personal film that's coming up next is the one that's the semi-autobiographical one I'm imagining I think so I don't I'm haven't followed that that's so. supposed to be his next project i can't remember i don't know what the heck it's called i just i know that seth rogan's attached to it as like his uncle or something yeah but yeah overall it's it's entertaining like the first time i watched it i was pretty bored up until um like i got to the tony and maria on the uh like outsider window scene before i left the movie <laughs> Mm-hmm. the first time so i was like god do i even want to go back and watch this but yeah after the the salt factory fight um i was pretty invested in the movie which is pretty late but i was kind of like mm, where's this going <laughs> I, I, I would think this would be the end of the movie so. you'd think but you'd be wrong <laughs> yeah also props to having rita moreno in the movie from the original that was awesome yeah she's great She's wonderful. She's the equivalent of Doc um, from the original. So I, I, I appreciated um, him honoring her with something to do in the movie. Yeah, might as well. Yeah. She's she's one of the few people still around from that. And she can still act act the pants off of every almost everybody around her. So good for her. Uh, next week, uh, I don't think we're seeing anything too important um definitely nothing ryan wants to see so we'll figure um, it out well we're seeing nightmare alley aren't we starring willem dafoe directed by guillermo del toro featuring bradley cooper Kate blanchett i unfortunately don't think that's coming out until the week after this one so mm, mm, might yeah. have to well i mean we've got i i <laughs> can we just can't we just fucking reveal it now we're watching spider-man no way home featuring willem dafoe also starring Tom Holland and possible uh, multiple Defoes. Mu- multiple Defoes? Possibly. It's a multiverse and there have oh. been two Green Goblins in the trailer. So wait, 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 wait Brad. They're going to clone Willem Defoe? No. Or are they going to bring Dade DeHaan back? <laughs> no, I just think when they open the multiverse, you know, there'll be a Sam Raimi. Willem Dafoe, and then there will be a whatever new version, more accurate to the comics that John Watts creates will be in there. Mm. And they'll probably double up and tag team on Spider-Man. Ooh. Double Dafoe. Double your pleasure. Double Dafoe. Um, Oh, double Dafoe foe. Z. Cause see, he's Defoe, Double and he's also he's also a foe. <laughs> uh, Willem corny, Defoe's corny great, hell. guys. <laughs> um, yeah, no, we're seeing Spider-Man: No Way uh, No Way Home. You know, uh, if you uh, can still find a theater that has the Prince Dispatch, you can watch Defoe there, plus Nightmare Alley, plus Spider-Man, and get tri- triple, triple triple Defoe. Oh my God, Brad, what an age we live in. <laughs> Calm down, Zach. He's literally only in one second of fucking during French Dispatch, though. No, he's not. He's got like he's, four or five sh- scenes. He doesn't. But he, I don't remember him saying anything in the movie. Oh, you didn't pay attention. He's in the chicken coop where he's like, yes. are you going to kill me? And then he's out oh, collecting right. the briefcase. Yeah. And yeah. then yeah, that's he's right. back when he eats the he gets a, That's the when food. the cops swarm him when he's getting the briefcase, right? They swarm him outside. Yep. Yeah, that's right. 
And then he's back when he gets delivered the food because he's about to die of starvation. Um, Favorite Defoe movie before we leave? Are you asking me what my favorite is? Yeah, what's your favorite? Before we leave, what's your favorite Defoe? Oh, gosh, I have never thought about it before. You might have the same answer that I do, oddly enough. Uh, I don't. I, like, I never thought about it. He's got such a large catalog. I'll, I'll just say mine, of, Shadow. I'll say mine, Shadow of the Vampire. That's pretty good. Um, yeah. <laughs> I also think of like he's also really good in a bad movie called Boondock Saints. <laughs> Thank you for clarifying your answer. He's really good in a bad movie. <laughs> uh, the Life Aquatic with Steve Zissou. Oh, he is great in that too. Um, I like him as the Rat in Fantastic Mr. Fox. Yep. Yeah, good voice. <laughs> uh, he's good in Spider Man. Uh, yeah, he's he's Willem Dafoe's one of our national treasures. Oh, the lighthouse. He's really good in the lighthouse. Yeah. Yep. Um God. Can we do like a Defoe explosion where we go down our favorite Defoe movies? <laughs> this is what happens when Ryan's not here. I'm allowed to spiel about Willem Defoe <laughs> and yeah. how he's better than any other Spider-Man character. Yeah, good thing I'm here because I'm going to wrap this up. So yeah, we're going to see Spider-Man <laughs> uh, No Way Home next week. Um, Following week is Matrix Revolutions and then I believe I talked to Ryan into doing Nightmare Alley as our last official original format episode. Uh, or The King's Man. You, you, you guys just don't want to watch Guillermo del Toro do a noir movie, do you? You just don't want to watch a good thing. <laughs> this is what you're telling me. Is is this a werewolf movie? Because I feel like this is a, a like he did a backdoor creature for the Black Lagoon for no, Shape of no, Water. No, no. They keep saying no. like, is he man or beast? And I feel like that's a, a werewolf thing. Because because the Clara because the fake clairvoyant in Nightmare Alley is a human monster. Now he's dealing with the human monsters. That's that's the thing. Because he's a fucking terrible person. Uh, and uh, but it also has the aesthetic of the carnival and the circus and whatnot. So you're gonna have some fun with that aesthetic. Um, and on top of that, it's a film noir by Guillermo del Toro. We should have been wanting this years ago. Cool. So till next week. <laughs> Bye. Watch more Defoe movies. Thank you for listening to this episode of Real Nerds Podcast. Real Nerds Podcast is a production of Neighborless Visions Multimedia. Thank you to Sparks Mandrill and Plan 9 Studios for our kick-ass theme song. Also, if you're in the Denver area and you're looking for a cool place to see movies, we see them at the Alamo Draft House in Littleton and now also in Sloan's Lake. Thank you to Colorado Coins, Cards, and Comics for supplying us with all our comic needs, especially you, Andrew. You know who you are. And a big shout out to James's mom. I'm giving you an electronic hug that you can feel through the airwaves. Thanks for listening and have a nice day. <laughs>